Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be home. Thank you for welcoming me home. Those of you that welcomed me. Those of you that didn't, too bad. I'm back. Um, originally, I had uh, planned on Dennis and Jeannie and Christy sharing a little bit about the trip to Israel. Um, that actually is not going to happen this morning for Dennis and Jeannie, and that's actually our first prayer request. Uh, Dennis's back is really bad. Uh, Jeannie took him to the emergency room yesterday because he was in so much pain and he was actually vomiting. So we want to lift up Dennis and Jeannie in prayer. Um, you know, he's been back and forth with the doctors and they tell him, oh, do these exercises and take these pills. And he does the exercises and takes the pills and nothing changes. So um, we just want to lift him up that God would give him an answer to fixing whatever is wrong with him. Um, but I do um, want to have Christy come up and share a little bit about what God showed her while we were in Israel. And, and just so you know, um, God had his hand on us the entire time we were there. Um, for those of you that were watching the news, there's a lot of stuff going on in Israel, uh, a lot of stuff going on in Jerusalem. Pay attention because that's Bible-centric in Israel, okay? Not America, Israel. And uh, we would go into a place on one day and the next day there would be riots and stabbings and stuff like that. that we, we never at any point felt unsafe. Um, but I, I don't want to get too far into it because there's some stuff that I know Christy wants to share with you. So, Christy, you want to come up and, and share a little bit? Sure. Um, first, I want to tell all of you guys thank you very, very much for sending us. We knew that um, God wanted us to go, but we didn't really know exactly why. I don't know that we still know exactly why, but um, it was incredible at every level from beginning to end. We were very, very busy the entire time. No days, Dennis and Jeannie said in previous trips, they had given them a day of rest. They never did that with us. We didn't have any rest at all, hardly. But it was good, and it was, uh, there was so much to see. We went multiple places every single day, and we would go to places and we wouldn't even have time to read the signs that they would post in front of things. So we would take pictures of them and then we would go back and I don't even know that we've read all of them just with all the information about the sites. And that was happening on the natural level, but it seemed like that's what was happening spiritually to us also. It was almost like we had a, a flash drive and every place we went, we'd plug it into the spirit of God and he would download a bunch of stuff, sometimes bring me to the point of tears and I wouldn't even really know why. And then we'd go to the next place and plug in and just like, and I, I remember Dennis and Jeannie and TJ mentioning the same thing. We just felt like God was just filling us with a bunch of stuff that we've got to still work through in our <coughs> But um, I have a few pictures that I want to show you in a minute. Um, I'm not going to show you all thousand of them because <laughs> I found myself looking at something and going, wow, and then God would just be speaking to me or, or, or just moving on me and I would take a picture and then I would look at it some more and it was like take another picture of the exact same thing. So I sometimes have four or five pictures of the same thing. Or 10 or 12. Or <laughs> <laughs> I did that especially looking at the Eastern Gate. I was like, wow, take a picture. Wow, take a picture. And I don't know why I thought having multiple pictures would explain what I was feeling. But it's just like everybody's looking at it going, wow, Mom, you took 18 pictures of the Eastern Gate. I know, it was incredible. So, there's, I won't show all of those to you, but um, the thing I think that really stood out to me the most, I knew in my head before I went that um, Israel, that the world was Israel-centric. That from the beginning of creation through the end of this earth, God centers everything on Israel. And um, we've seen so many scriptures being fulfilled. We see so many scriptures currently being fulfilled. When you go there, if you allow the Holy Spirit to, to lead you and be your tour guide, there is so much that he opens up your eyes to. They call it um, the land of miracles, the Jewish Christians especially. Even a Jew that we met who's not a Christian believes in the fulfillment of prophecy and that it's a, it's a, a, a place of miracles. And you can see it and everything is symbolic. If you let the Holy Spirit speak to you, you, you walk down the street and you see something that's symbolic. And you can see it moving on all different levels. And everywhere you would go, you would see something significant in the past and significant in the present and significant in the future. It was like this swirling thing that everywhere you would go if you let, if you let the Spirit of God lead you. And it was, it was amazing. Um, but I think the thing that really jumped out at me was the 
truth, you know, Glenn's been teaching us about spiritual warfare. And one of the things that we've learned is that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with the principalities and powers, and, and we kind of know in our heads that we don't really, that everything that happens on the material level starts in the spiritual realm. But you really see that, and you could really be aware of that in Israel. Um, because of it being the center of God's heart, and that little tiny land everywhere we went was probably smaller than the Bitterroot Valley, and you could stand on some high places and see just about everything that happened in the Bible <laughs> from where you were standing. It was amazing. Um, that little tiny piece of land is the center of God's heart, and everything that he's doing in the world starts from there and goes out and comes back. And um, <clears throat> you can see that in the spiritual realm also. I know you guys probably already know if you have any kind of spiritual discernment, you can go places in Montana and you just kind of feel an ick or a darkness. That is very, very prevalent in um, Israel. And um, it's amazing because you can see it in the natural realm. You guys, I don't know if you guys know, they have different zones. There's a zone A that's completely Palestinian controlled and if any Israelis go in there, the Palestinians can kill them or the Israelis can arrest them. And there's a zone B, which I think is controlled by Palestine, but the roads going through it are controlled by Israel. And then there's C, which is Israel controlled. Um, you can see it with your eyes going from a Jewish community to an Arab community because um, the Jewish communities are clean. You drive into an Arab community and there's trash everywhere and it smells different than the Jewish community. Um, but you can also feel it spiritually. We had that experience when we went into Bethlehem because Bethlehem is in the zone A and our Jewish Christian guide wasn't even allowed to go in there without a permit and he didn't get a permit. So we had an Arab Christian lead us in there but the darkness that you could feel when you went into that area was very real and as soon as you came out it was gone. Um, and it was interesting because there was pockets where there was very strong spiritual strongholds that, you, that were just dark, you could feel. Then there were places where you could kind of feel there was like a, a battle, a constant swirling kind of thing. I'm gonna show you pictures, if you could pull up the one of um, Megiddo. Um, this is standing up on Mount Carmel. If you guys remember, Mount Carmel was where um, Elijah had the contest with the, the prophets of Baal. We stood up there and we had a lesson and then um, Glenn took this, I think this is his panorama. This is basically the, the Valley of Armageddon. This is where the, the final battle is going to take place. Um, this was one of those places that was, you cannot pick it up from the picture at all. <laughs> but standing there looking over it, you could just almost see the spiritual battle going on. And there was an intensity. It's like you're looking in a stadium, um, like you're get, there's getting ready to get football game to start or something, you can kind of feel the intensity. That's what it felt like when you're looking mm -hmm. out over that. It's almost like there's something about ready to happen. And you could feel the, 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 the light and the darkness just kind of swirling. Um, it was amazing to look at it. You can look at, there's all kinds of things in there that I don't even remember that you can point out different things that happened throughout scripture. But while we were standing there um, looking at this, and, and Glenn and I both picked up on that kind of swirling spiritual warfare that was going on, we had like, four or five F-16s fly over the top of us. Mm. And that's when God really, six? six? Six. And that's when God really spoke to me what you see going on, especially in Israel, in the material world, with, with the battles and the, and the conflict, is a reflection of what's going on in the spiritual realm. It starts in the spiritual realm and it's reflected in what's going on between the Arabs and the Jews. So it was amazing. Um, and then if you would pull up the one of, looking, I think, looking into Jerusalem, yeah, you can, kind of see, you can kind of see in the far distance the wall. That's the wall of the old city of Jerusalem. You see the gold dome. That's where the temple is supposed to be. That's where the Dome of the Rock is now. That's another place where you could stand. This is, I think, when we were first coming into Jerusalem, we went on this place called Mount Scopus where you could stand and look over the top of it. And there was, um, that was another place where you could just feel the the light and the darkness, and the more, the more you would go into Jerusalem, you could feel it. It was, there wasn't necessarily the pockets like in Bethlehem and Nazareth and other dark places, but it was just like a constant battle. Um, in fact, when we were at the Western Wall, there was all these Jews lined up praying at the Western Wall, and they had these speakers right above it, <coughs> so they broadcast the Arab call to worship, which I'm gonna hopefully play for you in a minute. There was, that's, you could just feel the, the, the darkness trying to interrupt and, and um, disturb it that I was trying to do. Um, and then, actually, that's the Mount of Olives. That, that we were on? <coughs> oh, okay. The left the Jewish okay, so this was actually on the Mount of Olives, which was another <coughs> incredible place too. Um, but it was neat because one time we were walking through, I think we were just coming out of the place where uh, 
Peter probably was when he denied Jesus. And we were walking, I looked up at the clouds, and I remember commenting to, to Glenn, even the clouds here look different. They almost look like angels. And I took a picture, if you could put the cool clouds on. <laughs> I just took a picture because I thought it looked cool, but everybody that looks at it, a lot of people have been, it's like you can see stuff in it. It's like you can see the spiritual warfare going on over Israel. I see some different things that Glenn sees, and maybe it's just clouds, but I, I, I just feel like nothing there is by accident. Everything is intentional, and everything is symbolic. Um, so much that we learned about that. Um, and one other thing that I, that I wanted to show you that kind of illustrates this. Um, the, one of the last days we were there, we went to the garden tomb, and we had communion. And our leader, his name was Miles Weiss, was trying to lead us in communion. And one of the things that um, he was talking about was, uh, you know, Golgotha is called the place of the skull. And I don't know if any of you have been there or if you have seen pictures where the mountain where they think that Jesus was crucified looks like a skull. If you look at it today, it's different because last February there was some erosion that took place and part of it fell off so it doesn't look like it anymore. Mm -hmm. And the people that showed us that um, were... A, a British group owns the garden tomb, and they were explaining it's just erosion. We don't think it was intentional. Well, you talk to the Christian Jews, and they don't believe that it, it was just erosion. They believe it's intentional, because what happened is the Muslims built a cemetery on top of the place of the skull, so they've been digging a lot. And as they've been digging, they've been, it's been causing issues and breaking down the, <clears throat> the place of the skull. And they have a sign, which I didn't put up here, but they have a sign written in Arabic over the top of it, and the sign says, um, Allah is God and he has no son. It's right over the top of where you can look and see where, the, where the, the skull is, where Jesus maybe, most likely, was crucified. Just everything is just a mockery and a, an attack of everything that God has done there. And um, our, our guide is explaining this to us in this video. It's only like 30 seconds long, but um, I, I just was trying to record the sound, so I just videoed the stone where we were sitting, so you can't really see anything. But he was explaining to us this sign and while he's explaining this to us, we're getting ready to have communion, and we're, we have just got done singing some praise songs to Jesus. You hear this Arab call to worship him, and if you can hear it, maybe you can pick up the, I don't know, the conflict that's constantly going on. If you can play that one. And you know what it says there on that cemetery above the Golgotha? It says, there is no God but Allah and he has no son. This is really, really instructional. It's the first time this happened for me. It's really instructional. Did you hear that? Kind of the, the eerie thing that... Anyway, that's... Probably the most significant thing to me is the, um, the spiritual intensity of the place and how that confirmed to me that it's the central place of the world in, in God's mind. And um, we need to pray for them, because not, not, not just for their protection, and, um, but just because God has a purpose that he wants to do through that nation. And we just need to pray for his, his will to be done. And as we were leaving, actually God gave me this scripture earlier in the week, but as we were leaving, it really became real to me because while, like one said, while we were there, we didn't have any issues at all with safety. We never felt afraid. Um, and the scripture is from Jeremiah 51, 50. It says, you who have escaped from the sword, go, do not stand still. Remember the Lord from far away and let Jerusalem come into your mind. And I feel like that's just really significant for me anyway that you know, he showed me, and we escaped without <coughs> harm, and I'm just kind of waiting to continue to unravel everything that he's putting in my spirit that I haven't heard yet. That's it. Would you turn those back up, please? Um, we are actually going to put together a slideshow and um, we'll do this like on a Saturday rather than on a Sunday. Um, so those of you that want to sit through 1,080 pictures, <laughs> I don't. I'm going to streamline it. That was Israel. But Christy won't let me do that. So we're going to do that on a Saturday. We can kind of explain some of what we saw and what was going on. Um, Christy really hit on probably the biggest thing that I really got revealed to me over there um, 
we're incredibly arrogant here in America. We're, we are a very self-centered people. And with all the technology and all the advances that we have here, it's kind of amazing that we are. You know, that we live in such a narrow-minded way. I mean, we have the world at our fingertips, you know? I mean, whether it be through TV or through the internet, I mean, we can push a couple of buttons and be over in Timbuktu or Malaysia or Russia or, or wherever. But the, the thing that God showed me, uh, there were a couple things that the guides kept saying. Our guide, his name was Dror. He was a Messianic Jew. So he, had, he grew up as a Jew and became a Christian later in life. And so he has incredible insight to the Old Testament and how it relates to the New Testament. And I'm still, I have pages of notes just trying to keep up with things that he would just say offhand. Because to him it was a matter of course. It's like me saying, don't forget to breathe. You know, you're like, duh. Um, he, he would just say it off and, I, and we'd be like, wait, 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 explain that. What are you talking about? And um, one of the things that we were told, uh, the, the people that organized it through Zola Levitt Ministries, um, Miles and Catherine Weiss, he, he likes to say that Israel is 45 miles wide and 50 centuries deep. And it's, it's incredible wow. because you can't hardly kick over a rock without finding something significant underneath it. Uh, that picture that Christy showed you from Mount Carmel, it was really hazy. Um, I'll see if I can't clean it up a little bit. But from that picture, you look straight across the valley to Nazareth. And immediately to the right is Mount Tabor, where Deborah lived. And immediately to the right of that is Mount Gilboa, where Saul and Jonathan and, and his brothers died. And then you have uh, further off to the right, the valley that, that the armies would come up into Armageddon into Megiddo, uh, that's where Pharaoh Nico marched his army up. Off to our left, there was um, the Sea of Galilee and, and, and the headwaters of the Jordan. So, you know, everything was, was tightly compressed. As a matter of fact, <coughs> Psalm 122 took on a new meaning to me because it says Jerusalem is like a city compacted tightly together. Uh, I was shocked at how massive it is and how small. It is. Because the city of David, where everything started for the temple, the city of David is about 12 city blocks. Mm -hmm. At most. It's small. Um, and everything builds up. Nothing builds out. Everything builds up. So there's, there's a couple of things that um, I want to talk about today. And I won't, I'll try not to get too much into uh, what we did there. But these are things that really God spoke to me. Um, on our flight over, um, we left JFK, what about, seven? Seven, yeah. seven Eastern Time. And on the, the plane, we're on a 747, um, probably about 25 to 30% of the people that were on there were Orthodox Jews going home, the Hasidim. Okay. And they all belong to different sects. And they... Boy, you talk about ADHD. These people could not sit in their seats. And they would get up and they'd, and they'd have to pray for this. And, and But the groups wouldn't pray together. So you'd have one group that would go over here and pray. And this group would wait until they were done so they could get into that area and pray. And at the back of the plane, there was another group that was, that was praying. And, and then when they did their morning prayers, because we, we flew through the night, and then they got ready for their morning prayers, um, I was amazed at the attention they paid. They, they take the phylactery. For those of you that don't know, um, scripture says that you are to take God's word and bind it about your forehead and about your wrist, okay, and set it on the doorposts of your house. So they, they take this literally, and they take a portion of God's word, and they put it in a wooden box, mm -hmm. and they mount it on their head. So when you see these movies of you know, Jesus of Nazareth, and you see this funky horn on the guy's head, that's the phylactery. That's the, the part where God's word is. Mm -hmm. And they, they tie it. They actually put a second one on the inside of their arm, and they wrap this leather thong over and over and over, and then they hold the thong in their hand, okay? And then they put this one on their head, and I'm watching this guy, he's uh, just like two rows in front of me, and he's standing there, and probably, seriously, five minutes, he's measuring. Then he gets his mirror out, 
and he adjusts, and he puts some air away, and then he measures. Five minutes, okay? And he's going through this supply, and then he gets the tallit, and, and he's, he's got his, his, his yarmulke on, and, and, he's, and, then, and then he does his prayers, and he opens up his, his prayer book, and he reads the prayers. And um, Christy made a really interesting comment, because I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, what work? Mm -hmm. and, and Christy said, you know, it was, it was really kind of heartbreaking for her because they're going through all this process out of a deep desire to, to come before God, to, to, to be pure before God. And here we are sitting in our church just carrying on conversation with him without all that. And um, I, I just, I was amazed um, one of the poor guys behind us, the, these guys, the, the Hasidim, they're called the holy men, okay? And, and a holy man is not supposed to sit next to a woman that is not his family. Well, this is a whole bunch of people making pilgrimage to Israel. So a lot of them were just, the, the group was probably like 15 young men uh, being shepherded by a couple of the older men, a couple of the rabbis. And this man comes in and he looks and there's... Um, uh, one of the men was in the row that Christian and I were sitting in, and she was supposed to sit in the middle seat. And we knew, we had an awareness that this was going on, and so I sat in the middle. Boy, did I give up a lot for that guy. Okay, I don't want to sit in the middle. But we, we sat in the middle, and, but behind us, this guy comes in and he asked the, the man and the wife that were sitting, he was at the window seat, and he asked, could you please trade seats, because I can't sit next to a woman. And the guy said, no, I want to sit on the aisle. And so the guy said, okay, well, I'll go find another seat. So he went around and, and around and around and around. And they're calling, you know, sit down and buckle up. And nobody would trade seats with him. So he finally came back and had to sit in his seat by the window. And uh, these are the, the holy men. They, these are, are men that are striving with everything in them to be pure and righteous before God. And there's a, a number of scriptures that I'm going to read. And, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Romans 9, 10, and 11, okay? So if you want, go ahead and flip open to Romans, and I'm actually gonna start in Romans 10. We're gonna kinda go back and forth, okay? Um, by the way, on the flight back, we didn't have to deal with that because we left Israel, we left Tel Aviv at 12.30 in the morning, and we got into New York at 5.30 in the morning. And it took us 10 and a half hours to get there. So you do the math, it doesn't work out, but um, they, they didn't have, there was no morning or evening prayer, so they all sat in their seats and slept. Um, so I'm gonna start in Romans chapter 10. Uh, we're gonna start at verse one, so give me just a second. So this is Paul writing. Now, one of the things I need to make clear, a lot of times we read this without understanding the purpose of why this was written, okay? We, we tend to read the New Testament very um, short-sightedly, okay? Paul was writing for a specific purpose, and I believe chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's writing for the same reason that, that we struggle with today, okay? He's writing because the Romans... Had, or the, the Roman church, the Christian church in Rome, had basically written off the Jews. They, they basically said, okay, well, they've forsaken, they've lost, they're out, we have no use for them. Okay? One of the things that, that we have to contend with is that from about 300 AD on, the Christian church had tried very, very hard to remove the Jewishness of the Bible. It's worked very hard to take it out. Okay? But from God's promise to Abraham all the way through to Revelation, this is a Jewish book. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong, we're going to talk a little bit about how this works with the Christian church today. But you need to understand that God of his own purposes and will, chose Israel. Just like he chose that spot. Okay? Now, the nation of Israel, um, you look back over the last several hundred years, anybody that's been to Israel, they say it's a barren wasteland. 
It's, it's a desert. There is nothing of value here until God brought his people home. Because God promised them that when they lived in that land, it would flourish. And that was one of the guys we were talking to. He was an Orthodox Jew. He said, have you noticed how good the fruit tastes here? And I'll tell you what, the fruit there is incredible. Incredible. I have never tasted better fruit anywhere. Okay? I got home and I looked at the fruit in the store and I went, <sighs> Okay? He said, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. They have not found any plants yet that they can't grow in Israel. Okay? So you're talking everything from pomegranates to apples. And it grows. And you're looking, you're driving through. We went down through the desert going to uh, Masada. And you look and there's, there's nothing. It's just barren. And then all of a sudden, there's a grove. A bunch of banana trees. Well, look, there's mangoes. You know, and, and they have an incredible way. God has blessed them that they are making um, things grow. Well, let, let me rephrase that. They're not making it grow. God is. Because God says he will make a way in the wilderness. Okay? He will make water springs in the desert. Okay? And that's what's happening. So, before I get into this, you need to understand that there is a purpose and a plan for what God has done to that people and that nation. We're going to take a little bit of a look at that right here. So first, starting in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Paul says, brothers, now, first let's, just so you know, brothers there doesn't mean guys. Okay, the, the Greek word is adelphoi, which means brothers and sisters. It's like siblings. Okay? Um, so, women, you got to pay attention to. Uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them being Israel, um, that better be God. <laughs> My heart's desire and prayer to God for them, Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay? Now let me explain. We, we had a talk with an Orthodox Jew who had a shop, and he was explaining um, kind of the Jewish standpoint. You know, and one of the things that he said, because it's very difficult to minister to Jews, because they believe they've got the word of God. They believe the New Testament is false. So he was saying, well, the first thing that he said that just kind of astounded me is, we are content with our religion. We don't need anymore. Okay? The, the second thing that he said, when we were talking about all the religious things that they have to do, he said, this we do because we love God. For example, if you loved your wife and, and she asked you to do something for her, wouldn't you want to do more than what she asked you to show your love for her? Yes. Well, that's why we do all of these things for God. Okay? And this passage addresses directly what he's talking about. Okay, let's look at this again. Paul is bearing witness that they have a zeal for God. I'll tell you what, the Hasidim, those that are Orthodox, those that have the faith, they, have, they are zealous. Um, as a matter of fact, as some of you may have read um, or, or seen on TV, the Muslims burned uh, Joseph's tomb. Okay? I don't know if it made it over here, but the next day, about 20 Jews went in to fix it. Now, that's a zone A area, which means it's completely Palestinian controlled. They have signs posted warning the Jews, the warning the Israelites, do not go under here under danger of your life because they can kill you in here. And they will. Well, these 20 Jews did not get permission. They did not talk to the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force. They just got up. The rabbi said, we need to go clean this and make it right. So they went. They were zealous. 
We got to we got to restore dignity to Joseph's tomb. I don't think Joseph cares. Okay, but they went. The Palestinian police found him, started beating on him. The Palestinians saw the police beating on him, so the Palestinians started beating on him. The Israeli Defense Force had to drive in and drag them out. And now they are facing criminal charges for violating Zone A. Okay? This is the zeal that they have. All right? Um, so they are zealous for God, but they don't have knowledge. Okay? Which is an interesting thing for Paul to say, because by the time a typical Jewish boy is 12, at this period, he has the Torah memorized. Uh, I don't know how many of you have done that. I have not. Okay? So, they, they have knowledge, but, but what kind of knowledge is, is he talking about here? But not according to knowledge. And then he goes on, he says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God. Okay? You see, this is, this is something that concerns me about church today, because I'm wondering if we're not becoming like the Jews. Okay? Now, we know that God has established Ten Commandments, right? Okay? And that's, that's tough enough. I mean, we had one commandment in the garden, and we couldn't make it. So God establishes Israel, and he gives Ten Commandments. Well, the, the Jews take these directives, and they start widening the boundary. So if this is a bad place for me to go, I'm going to back up here and make the line here, so I'll never approach that. That's my righteousness. That is how I am proving to God how faithful and righteous I am. Well then, Joe Rabbi 2 comes up and says, Ah, you may be so righteous as to not stand there, but I'm not going to go here. That's how righteous I am. And all of a sudden, we have 640-some <coughs> laws written by man to improve on God's laws. Oy vey. <laughs> okay? Um, I was so disappointed. We got to see the Sabbath elevator. <clears throat> the Sabbath elevator, because on the Sabbath you're not supposed to push a button. The Sabbath elevator stops at every floor on the way up and stops at every floor on the way down. And it opened for Christy and I, and I was like, yes, we've only got two floors. I get to see the set. It didn't. It must have had a Gentile sensor. Because we got in and we waited for it to go, and it didn't go. And it waited. So I reached over and I pushed our floor, and it took us straight to our floor. So, evidently, they're more advanced than I thought. Okay, so. They are ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. Okay? I, I see nowhere in Scripture where God says that your phylactery has to be two inches or two finger breadths above your eyebrow. Okay? I, I don't see what a lot of what they were doing in order to fulfill their righteousness is required of God. This, this passage just jumps out at me. And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to his. Okay? What did Jesus, who, who did Jesus get the most frustrated with? The religious people. The people that should have known better, but they had traded the righteousness of God for righteousness of their own that was not righteousness. And then he even goes so far as he says, you travel the length and the breadth of the land to make a single convert. And then you make him twice the son of hell that you are. You bring him to the very gates of heaven, and then you deny him entry. Okay? And this is a caution to us. Because how many times in churches have you seen where people get caught up in a rule to expand on, to make better than God's rules, so that we, we don't cross the line. Oh, how Jewish we are.
For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, if Christ is the end to the law, does that mean the law has no value? No, of course not. Why was the law put into place? To show us how desperately we needed help. To show us, look, this is the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And you can't attain it. You'll never get there. You're never going to be sinless enough to get there. Because you have to be absolutely sinless. Okay? So, when Jesus came, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. He attained that righteousness. And then, his sacrifice, his blood, I love that song. He is our what? Our righteousness. So I don't have to attain the law anymore. Now then, does that mean we just get to go and do whatever we want? No, because now we are many Christs, Christians, those who look like him, so our lives should be lived like he lived his, yes? Okay, so it's not freedom to sin, it's freedom from sin. Okay? See, this is, a, this is the thing. The difference between us and the world is we can choose not to. We have now the ability, because of God's Spirit living within us, to resist sin. I'm not going to do that. Nope. Nope. Unfortunately, most of us fail to make use of this frequently, and we stumble. The scripture says we all stumble in many ways. Okay? Thank God that His grace is greater than my sin. Okay, so let's let's move forward a little bit. Um, Romans eleven, verse seven. St still speaking about Israel. Okay, so there's we talked about their righteousness. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. What, what was it seeking? The righteousness of God. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened. As a matter of fact, I want to make something clear to you, real quick. There is a growing segment of Jews in Israel and throughout the world that are coming to salvation. They are seeing the fulfillment of everything promised in their Bible, the Jewish Bible, they're seeing that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And some of the ways that these people are coming to salvation is incredible. I mean, we're talking miraculous signs and wonders drawing them to salvation. Okay, That's the remnant that we read about over and over and over again in Scripture. There is a remnant in Israel. Okay, And it's growing. Okay, So... Um, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. Now, why in the world would God choose a people and then put them in a place where they would become hardened? Why would God blind them and make them deaf? Why would God do this to them? What's that? That's exactly right. So we're going to look over, we're going to jump down a couple verses. Um, verse 11, Paul says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Is God planning to destroy them? No, by no means. He's not making them stumble so they can fall. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, unless some of you have some Jewishness in you that I'm unaware of, that's us. I got 3%. I'm 3% Jewish. I haven't figured out which 3% it is. Okay? Salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? So as to make Israel jealous. Okay? So, God has given them a, a spirit of stupor. 
He has blinded them and made them deaf. So that salvation can come to us. This is a fulfillment of the promise that he gave to Abraham. That through you, all the nations will be blessed. Through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. That seed being Jesus Christ. Okay? So, God made them blind so that we might have salvation. And that they might be made jealous for what we have received that was intended originally for them. Now, not to exclude us. God's plan has always been to the Jew first and then to the, the rest of us, the Greek or the Gentile, okay? But remember, I, I told you a couple weeks ago, the last will be first and the first will be last. I really believe Jesus is speaking to the fact that salvation came to the Jews first. We see in the book of Acts that overall they rejected it. God then sent out apostles to the Gentiles, and they have received salvation first. Now, it, it's interesting... Do you know what the Jews call us? <laughs> Notzim. Notzim. They, they use it because it's a derivative of Nazarene. Okay? But they don't understand why Nazareth was named Nazareth. Because Nazareth has two meanings. Uh, there, there's two ways that it's interpreted in the Old Testament. The first one is um, Jeremiah says that the watchmen will call out on the hills and salvation will come to Israel. <coughs> okay? That word is notzi. Okay? Same word for what they call us, the watchmen. Okay? The other word that they use is that it's a shoot, a branch coming up from the root. Okay? Which both, both things we see in Scripture. I believe we are seeing the fulfillment, the beginnings of the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel because the word has gone out from Israel. Israel ceased to be a nation. They went for hundreds and hundreds of years without being a nation. We got to go up to Masada. For those of you that don't know Masada, what's Masada? Okay. Masada was the last place of Jewish culture before they ceased to exist as a nation. Okay, so about 73 A.D., Masada was was overthrown, and and Jewish culture in Israel ceased to exist. Okay, so we got to go and see this place. Now, from that point to 1948, Israel was not a nation. As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting because the day that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, we got to see that the Qumran village as well, the, the cave where they found it. The day that it was found was the day that the United Nations convened to discuss whether or not Israel should become a nation again. Okay? And the, the uh, Old Testament tells us, can a nation be born in a day? And yet Israel was born in one day. The United Nations voted, yes, we're going to get them back to home. Okay? So... God is fulfilling this prophecy. So now Israel is back where they are supposed to be. People are still moving back, coming into Israel. The Jews are coming from all over. I mean all over. I'm, I'm like Ethiopia, Russia, the Far East, America. They're, they're coming from all over. But what's interesting is that in the last few years, there's been a resurgence, a, a, not a resurgence, a surgence, a surging of Christians coming from all around the world to minister to the Jews. The watchmen are on the hills and they're calling out to Israel. And we're going to start seeing God move in the fulfillment of everything that he has promised for them. Okay? So, he has blinded them for a time that we might be saved and that they might become jealous. So, what does that mean for the Jews? Did God just thumb his nose at them? Well, let's go down a little bit further. Let's pick up in verse 29. Now, this is, this is a passage that I understand generally can be applied across the board, but it really frustrates me how often people like to take this for themselves. Paul is using this passage specifically to speak about Israel. Okay, And it says, 
Um, I'm going to actually back up to verse 28. As regards the gospel, they, the Jews, Israel, are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. When God has called something to be, it will be. Okay? It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what you think. If God has called it to be, it will be. And God has promised to the people of Israel their salvation. Okay? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, does that describe anyone but me? Okay, just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Okay, now do you see this cycle that's going on here. Okay? God has called Abraham out of all of the people of the earth. Why did he choose Abraham? Why did he choose a wanderer? Okay? You, you know what I, I believe? I believe Abraham's father, Haran, was originally the one that God had called to, to be this person. Because if you read the scripture, it says that they were living in the land of Ur. And God called them, he called Haran to go to Canaan. But they didn't go there. They just bypassed it and settled in an area to the north and the east of what is Canaan. And then God spoke to Abraham, or Abram at that time, and said, okay, you, take your family, your possessions. I'm taking you to Canaan. And Abram got up and went. Okay, I think his father blew it. Personally. Okay? Because scripture says that he called him to go out of Ur to Canaan. But he never made it to Canaan. Okay? So Abram goes, and by the way, we got to walk the, the road. It's actually called um, Highway 60, and it's called the Patriarch's Road. It's the road that they used to travel in and out of Israel. Incredible. Um, so Abram comes in. Why did God choose him? I and mean, basically, he's a Bedouin. He's a, he's a traveler, living in a tent. The most incredible thing I've ever seen. They still have them. And they have satellite TV. <laughs> There's a tent with a satellite dish stuck on the outside of it. <laughs> like, really? Okay, so, so he calls, I mean, he's got Sumeria. He's got Egypt. He's got um, the Hittites. He, he has places where he could call Fourth, a mighty dynasty, but he calls Abraham. Why did he choose Abraham? Does anybody remember what God told him? He said, I have chosen you not because you are great, but because you're small, because you're weak. That through you, I can demonstrate my power. Okay? He didn't need a mighty nation. He needed someone to go forth that he could work through. So he takes Abram, makes him Abraham, and he births not just one, but two mighty nations, okay, Isaac and Ishmael, and then Isaac, being the child of the promise, gives birth to Jacob and Esau, and that's still the contention we see today, folks. Isaac and Ishmael is still the contention, the contention that we see today. Okay? This is why I don't believe there will ever be peace between the Arabs and the Jews until that time when God comes and rectifies everything. Okay? Because it was prophesied way back with Ishmael and Isaac that they will be at odds. Okay? So God has called them. He's made a nation for himself. He sends them into Egypt for 400 years and they suffer for at least part of that time as slaves. And then God demonstrates his strength yet again. 
by delivering them from Egypt and bringing them into Israel. He demonstrates his strength again by having them drive out <coughs> excuse me, the nations that were there before them. Why did God drive those nations out? You've got to pay attention to what Scripture says. God drove them out because they failed to do what he had called them to do. All of those nations that were there had the word of God at some point. And they failed, and they turned their backs on him, and they worshipped false gods, and they sacrificed their children, and they did things abhorrent to God's eyes. And so he said, you know what? You will cease to be a people. Okay? So, God has made a nation. He has put them through hardship. They became a nation again. We're seeing this cycle come out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. The word went forth. Now the word is coming back. The word is coming back to Israel. And eyes that were blinded are starting to see. And ears that were deaf are starting to hear. And God is doing a work in that people, and he is growing the remnant there. Okay. Now, do you ever wonder why they're surrounded by enemies? God planned it that way. It was not poor planning on their part. It was divine planning on God's part. Why? Because he is still going to show his strength and his might through those people to the world. Okay? <clears throat> and I believe we are coming up closer and closer to that time that we will see this. Um, I know Josh spoiled you guys last week. i got to break you back into a longer message. Um, where does this leave us? God has called them. He has gifted them. He will not go back on his word. He has for a time blinded them that we might come to salvation. Psalm 122, I'm going to read the entire psalm. It's not very long. Um, this is one that God has been speaking to me over and over. As a matter of fact, every day when I do my Bible reading, I um, sit quiet for a while and I just ask what God would have me read beyond what my daily reading is. And for the last week and a half, he's brought me to Psalm 122. Uh, Psalm 122, I'm just going to start in one read through. This is a song of ascents of David. Do you guys know what a song of ascents means? When the Jews came into the temple, they would come up the southern steps, which are still there. And they found an interesting thing. The steps going up are not regular. There will be one short step and one long step. Mm -hmm. Two short steps and a long step. A short step, a long step. A short, a short, a long. A short, a short, a short, a long. And the idea is you cannot walk quickly up those stairs. The long, the, the broad step, when they would take the short step, they'd step up onto the broad step, and they would read one of the Psalms of Ascent. Okay? And then they'd take a couple more steps, and they'd get to another broad spot. And they would read another Psalm of Ascent. Jesus did this. Because he did everything that a Jew was supposed to do and more. So when he was walking into the temple, he did the same thing that all the Jews were around him were doing, but he did it with the understanding of what it meant. Okay? So, um, the Song of Ascent says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you glad to come to church? Or, or is it a labor? Okay? Um, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. Uh, some of the other translations say compacted tightly. To which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Okay, I believe that God is speaking to us across thousands of years to remind us that Jerusalem is special to him. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you like Jerusalem or despise Jerusalem, God 
has a heart for that city. He chose it. He chose it. He chose that place to make his dwelling. As a matter of fact, the city of David, the shape of it is, is the, the shape of a foot, a footprint. And the Jews say, this is where God's footstool is, the city of David. And the Temple Mount, which sits right above it, is his dwelling. Okay? So, God is speaking to us across the, the years and saying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There is no peace there. There is no peace there. Okay? Um, the old Jerusalem is divided into four quarters. The Palestinian quarter, the Arab quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, the Christian quarter, and the Armenian quarter. Okay, there is no peace in Jerusalem, and even outside the walls. Um, the Jews are not allowed to go into Zone A, but the Arabs can live in Zone C. And they do. And they've taken sections for their own. Bethlehem is a section for their own. There are other parts, um, the, the area that the empty tomb and Golgotha is in is in an Arab controlled part. It's Jewish land, but the Arabs control it. They, they lived in that area, okay? Um, there is no peace there. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good, okay? Now, one other thing that I want to read to you, um, I'm going to jump way back to Genesis chapter 12. If the gifts and the calling are without repentance, they are irrevocable, okay? Then this has got to hold true today. All right? Now the Lord said to Abram, this is verse 1, Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Pay attention here, folks. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. Okay? God has said that if you bless Abram and his descendants, the nation that is now Israel, the Jews, that he will bless you. But if you dishonor them, he will curse you. Okay? This is God speaking. And we just read in the New Testament... These things are irrevocable. God is not taking them back. Okay? So, as a people who have the word, we have a choice. And I'm laying this choice before you today. You can choose to be a Pharisee. I've got the law, and I'm going to stand on my own interpretation, my own understanding. I'm going to stand on my own righteousness on this. Or I'm just going to hold fast to what this says. The righteousness of God is based on faith. Okay? Faith. God has called a people. Israel. But then he blinded them and deafened their ears that he could call us. What does Peter say? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Okay? God is making of us a nation that is not the geographical outline of the United States because the nation that he is making us into supersedes every national boundary that we know. And from that, 
he is calling the Nozim, us, the watchmen, to call out to the people of Israel that they too might be saved. What God has intended at the start, the first, is now the last, and what was last is now first, but he will bring them all into his house. Okay? We're the engrafted vine. We're the wild vine. We got to see an old, old, old olive tree. Uh, the, the guide said it was the oldest one in Jerusalem. And it was gnarly. It was huge and it was gnarly. And I got a picture of it. But in this old, gnarly olive tree, they had engrafted several branches that were bearing fruit. Okay? And do you know how you engraft a branch? You take the tree and you cut a cross in it. And you insert the new branch. Okay? So we have been engrafted in through the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, let me make one political statement here. I'm not telling you to agree with everything Israel does. Keeping in mind that they are working without God driving them. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do things that are wrong. What I am telling you, though, is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray, pray blessings on them and not curses. And be prepared because a time will come where you'll have to make a decision whether you'll stand with Israel or you won't. Because if you're not standing with them, you're going to stand against them. Now, we don't stand with Israel for political reasons. We stand with Israel for scriptural reasons. Okay? Father, we bless you today. We honor you. We thank you for the grace and mercy that you have shown. Father, that you have made salvation available to everyone. Father, that you sent your son to be a Jew. To live according to the promise you gave Abraham. That through him you would bless many nations. We thank you, Father, that even though for a time the Jews have been blinded, it is because of this, Father, that we have salvation. So rich and free. And Father, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we pray, Father, that you would protect them in the spiritual warfare that is going on there, Father. We know that you are allowing for a purpose to fulfill your plans. But, Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, Father, blessings on the Jewish people. Father, ultimately, that they would come to acknowledge the Messiah has come. That they would know the salvation that they are so desperately seeking is there for the taking. We ask, Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see and open our hearts, Father, that we would feel. Father, let us build calluses on our knees as we kneel in prayer. We bless you today, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.